to Wonder Women Unite, presented by Renee Horman Productions. So much for being here. Wow, what a wonderful, wonderful group. I'm just really touched. Um, you know, um, when you think about a superpower um, and unleashing it, what that means to me is that you're digging deep and you're owning your power. It means you're going to that place that's already inside of you. All of you have a Wonder Woman inside of you, except for Martin Ash and a few others that are here. We got some Wonder Men in the house. But, you know, um, when you think about that, it's just going for what makes you uncomfortable, digging deep, taking risks. That's what it means to me. So tonight, what I want you to do is really think and feel, what does that mean to you? What do you need to do to go to the next level to unleash your superpower? So let me tell you a little bit about me. Um, it's not always comfortable to get up and talk about yourself. Uh, but when I look back as a little girl, I've always been unleashing my superpower. But I didn't really do it on a regular basis. And you're going to hear from a coach, um, Deb Sheslo, that I actually um, hired to help me take my life to the next level and she helped me systematize having <laughs> success on an ongoing basis so basically it took a lot of the things that I did as a little girl and um, gave me tips and tools to actually make it part of my life so um, it's an exciting time right now um, to be doing that so who wants to unleash their superpower is anybody up in the house Unhappy in their job. Don't like the boss. <laughs> Anybody? Well, she brought your boss with you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Awkward. So, who's sitting on the couch every night eating chips, watching Shark Tank, thinking, how can I invent the next best dating app? Anybody? Or, how can I just get a date? <laughs> so, anyway. Um, I grew up in a blue-collar family, and um, my parents loved me and cared about me uh, very much. And um, at the age of uh, second grade, I had, had three major surgeries. So my life um, early on was difficult, but I had this amazing ability to play sports. Um, my parents thought I was too fragile to play sports, though. So I have this, um, actually, person who's in the house tonight, Lois Kessler, who happened to come here. That was my playground park director when I was a little girl. And she kept convinced my parents to let me play sports. So without that, I wouldn't be here tonight because I made it my purpose and my focus to become a tennis player and get a scholarship at the University of South Florida. We couldn't afford college. Nobody went to college in my, in my family. <laughs> my parents, again, great people. They care for me. Um, uh, grew up in a broken home, but you know, I never went hungry. Always had shelter. But I spent my time in solitude, banging tennis ball up against the wall. I had a little book that had pictures of a lady that knew how to play tennis, and it was just instructor guy. So I'd put it on the ground, and I'd hit, and I'd hit, and I'd hit, and I'd hit. Every little stroke, now I could just visualize exactly how to play. That's how I learned tennis, because we couldn't afford a tennis club, or really many lessons. I had a few lessons. So I focused really hard on that, um, and took action every day to accomplish it. 
Um, and it was my um, escape as a little girl. You know, some people do drugs, some people do other things, and thank God I had sports. And I had a gift to play sports. So long story short, I lettered eight times at Chamberlain High School in different sports, four different sports actually. Um, went on to play Division I scholarship tennis at the University of South Florida. I got my master's degree ultimately after getting my bachelor's degree. And um, went on to enjoy a successful career in public service in the, the government locally. And then I produced um, an amazing film that was actually one of those things that you, you know, reach outside your comfort zone. Be, that's a, a, just an amazing time in your life. I had never produced a movie before, didn't know how to do it, and didn't have the money to do it. No clue, just wanted to serve the story and tell a story. And what was happening is, it's called 10 at the Top in Tampa Bay, it's out on my, my website actually. Um, there's an unprecedented time where there were all these women at the top of government institutions in Tampa. And I was like, oh my God, somebody gotta do something about this. So I made a movie, it premiered on PBS. So this isn't about me, this is about you, and I only tell you these things about me because if I can do it, you can do it, okay? So I know there's people here, um, you know, that um, have some things that they wanna do and take it to the next level, and um, I produced these events to, and I'm gonna have more of those, to um, encourage you and give you the tools and things you need to move forward. So um, I, I'm working on my third movie. I'm writing a book called Against the Wall. <laughs> and um, I uh, look forward to um, staying connected with you all. Without further ado, let's bring up the Wonder Woman for tonight. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. Please come forward. She was born Gail Corrine Sirens in 1954. The family moved from Jacksonville to Tampa when she was three. Her mother Betty, along with the help of her grandmother, raised Gail after a freak elevator accident killed her father when Gail was just six years old. Her mother eventually remarried. Floyd's self took on the role of full-time dad to a teenage girl with big dreams. After graduating from Florida State University, Gail joined WFLA News Channel 8 as a sports reporter and became a star on the rise. I suspect one of the writers you were talking about. She did freelance work as a play-by-play -play announcer for ESPN, a substitute for NBC sports anchor Bob Costas, and the first, and as it turns out, only woman to do play-by-play -play for a regular season NFL game. The pitch to Herman Hurd. Gail's solid performance led to more network opportunities, forcing her to make a decision, pursue her sports passion, or anchor herself to Tampa Bay. You deserve a round of applause. That's got a, you must have broke some kind of record. Excellent, yeah. thank you, I feel Gail. like I've been eating pot, is what I feel like. Gail's decision was rewarding. She and Bob Height would create one of the most successful and longest running TV news co-anchor teams in the nation. Rocket 
give us a one minute introduction, <coughs> then I'm going to ask some questions and I need you to be thinking about some questions because I'm going to give you a chance to ask the question, okay? So, let's start off with Fentress Driscoll. Give us your introductory remarks. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. What will you do with your one wild and crazy life? Anyone know that line? It's the last line to a poem called The Summer Day. I love that poem and I read it from time to time and every time I do, it acts sort of as a gut check to make sure what am I doing with this one wild and precious life, precious life that I have. And as far as we know, we only have one. And even if we had more, we probably wouldn't remember. So, <laughs> um, so what have I done? So I have grown up in nearby Lakeland, Florida. I have learned to love fiercely through the love and support of my friends and family, many of whom are here tonight, including my parents. Thank you for being here. I have learned to stand on the shoulders of giants with grandparents, uh, only one of whom graduated from high school, at least one of whom did not finish elementary school, but understood the importance of encouraging their children to be the best that they could be. And then that trickled down to my generation which now has a lawyer and a doctor and an engineer and a writer and so many other things. I have worked hard. I've learned to do that, graduating first in my class in high school and then going on to the college of my dream, Harvard, graduating with honors and then going on to the law school of my dream at Georgetown. I am, am I going too long? <laughs> I'm not talking about I have learned, um, I have had a great career. I've worked for a law firm with mentors who understand the power of diversity and who have encouraged that and who have encouraged me every step of the way. And so what will I do with my one wild and precious life in the future? I, I hope to accomplish many things, including to stay involved in the community. But tonight, I just hope that there's something that I might share that helps you to better answer that question of what you intend to do with your one wild and precious life. Thank you. Thank you. Get what she said. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I'm not nearly as eloquent as you, and I have no teleprompter, so I'm totally okay. <laughs> but there's just, a, we all need to know who we are and, and, and who we want to be. And the one thing that I have always said in my life is that to thine own self be true. That's my, that's it, right there. But I, I have to look in the mirror every day and I have to say, this is who I am. Today I liked who I was. I didn't like the way I did this. I didn't like the way I did that. Or I liked I would have done better if I'd done this. But you have to be true to yourself because the second you try to be someone, you're not. And in my business, there were a lot of people, you know, that you walk in and all of a sudden you're talking like this because this is the way people on TV talk. You know, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work for anyone to be someone other than themselves. And I think, um, you know, being in a business where there was a lot of scrutiny, not, um, I have to just tell you my favorite story right here off the top of the bat. Uh, 
there was, this is what woman came up to me because when you're on television you're everyone's best friend <laughs> and so you know you have a lot of conversations with strangers um, this cute little woman came up to me one day at the mall uh, a little Hispanic lady cute as she could be came up to about here on me and she reached up and gave me one of these and said, Gail honey you're so pretty in person to be so ugly on that TV <laughs> So I think in life to have thick skin is a really important quality to have. And trust me when I tell you, when you make your living on television, if you don't have thick skin, you will cry yourself to sleep at night because people in the public will say absolutely anything to you. Thank you. So. You, you all saw the video. I've been blessed to do some pretty cool things. Flying supersonic jets, breaking stacks of bricks in karate. You know, and people come up to me all the time, and have been tonight several times. Wow, I read your stuff. You're such a remarkable person. Well, I want to shut that down right here. Um, because I don't believe that, and I, I don't want you to look at it that way. I am not a remarkable person. I am an everyday <laughs> average person from a middle, middle class, everyday average family. But I took things, I dared to dream, and then I took things one step at a time. And what I learned along that journey is that everybody <coughs> indeed does have that power within them. Everybody can make their dreams come true. Everybody can reach deep, as Renee was saying, and make it happen. And so I, I want to challenge you with that right off the bat tonight as you're listening. Think about something. Where would you be if every time you said, I should, you actually did. See, for me now, I'm not doing, that's not cool anymore. What's cool for me now is, is what you're seeing here, so other people's success stories, because there's no greater joy for me than to watch that twinkle in the eye or that smile when somebody else achieves their dream, their dream and I was able to help them be a small part of that. So that's what it's all about, is turning shoulds into dids. So don't hold yourself back tonight. You might get that little tidbit that's going to allow you to do that. Great, thank you. Okay, so the, for the uh, first question, um, and uh, let's start with Gail on this one. Tell us how you chose your career path and how you got your start in it. Well, I always was a talker, um, like a, a like teacher's <coughs> trouble at school kind of talker. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I figured if I could get paid for talking, that that would be a plus, that would be a bonus. Um, but primarily, I went to school at Florida State, and I was in the mass communications department there, and I had um, some really good teachers, and then I had one professor who told me with the voice that I have, I will never make it in broadcasting, and I probably should figure out something else to do. Which, I just, you know, uh, he was like really old, you can't even hear me. <laughs> he was really, really old. I don't, think he, I don't think he taught much after I was there. Maybe I did that to him, I don't know. But I had the opportunity to go to work as an intern at WFSU TV. And I was behind the scenes, I would run teleprompter, I would be the person who was typing in the names underneath people when they were on TV and stuff. And I did that for about six months, and then there was an actual on-air job that was open. And um, so the, the head of the school of WFSU TV um, asked me if I would be interested in applying for that job, and I said I certainly would. And long story short, um, I did a show as a junior in college called Break of Day, and as the name might suggest, I had to be at work every morning by 4.30 or 5 a.m., and I was still a co-ed in college trying to have fun. <laughs> and I was on this kind of talk news show. And um, then there was another show that came along at the TV station. So at the time I graduated from Florida State, I actually had been on television for two years. And the way you get jobs in TV is you send a tape. You know? And so I had a tape to send because I'd had these, these two years of a paid job at a, a television station, albeit small and a campus station, but 
the tape's a tape. And I ended up getting the job at WFLA-TV as a 22-year-old. I was a sportscaster for my first nine years of my career. And then one day they came in and asked me if I'd be interested, interested in being the news anchor. And I, I thought it was a joke, to be honest with you. But it wasn't. And I had to think long and hard about it. I was doing a lot of freelance work for ESPN, having fun doing that. And, you know, being a sportscaster is a fun job. And, um, but I decided to do that. And so for the remainder of my 29 years there, I was there for 38 years. For the remainder of the 29 years I was there, I was the news anchor. And it was a great opportunity, and it was a great gig, and I, I loved every minute of it. There was never a time when I said to myself, oh, I wish I didn't have to go to work today. Um, because you know the great thing about being in the news business is every day is new, because <laughs> it's the news. And so you, know, you never really knew what you were going to have going on that day when you went to work. And I was born and raised in Tampa, and this was the voice in the face, the trusted face growing up here for me to get the news. But I always swore that the reason I got jobs when I did is because the news directors thought, well, if someone's just listening to their TV and they're not really watching, they might even think it's a man. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, I, have, I kind of have a man voice. On telephones, I almost always misidentify as a, uh, a man. Uh -huh. Sir. It's a great voice. Definitely. <laughs> Well, it's kind of an interesting journey. I'll, I'll make it short and sweet, but um, my dream was to be a mom. I wanted to be just like my mom and have kids, but I wasn't going to sit around waiting for Mr. Wright to come along while I did that. So my second dream was to fly. So I, I went to college and, and got my aerospace engineer degree and went into the Air Force and was fortunate enough to graduate at the top of my class and got to choose my assignment. And so I chose to be an instructor pilot. And before that, I had some time while I was waiting to go to pilot training, I, I chose to uh, go back to my high school and coach the volleyball team that I had been on and let it on. And, and then after the Air Force, I ended up in the construction industry and, and I was running the green building program for half the state of Virginia and my favorite part was teaching the builders how to build green and how to save energy. And it wasn't the inspecting or the building, but the teaching. And, and then my life kind of crashed and burned uh, everything fell apart, I fell apart, and as I was coming back out of that, that fire there, it hit me, you know, it was either let the misery continue to spiral, or, you know, what is it you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? What do you like to do? And I always thought that was, well, if I could go back in the Air Force and fly supersonic jets again, then I'd be happy, but I can't, so I can't be happy. And, and an interesting thing got me over that, and then it hit me. What I like to do is teach and train and, and help people go to the next level. I, I was in karate and I wasn't the best technician in the world, but I was a great teacher and I, I, I helped my students become better than I was in karate. And then that, that, that information that got me out of my funk and saved my life, I thought, well, wait, if I love teaching and now I know what to do to not be miserable, why not teach that? And it kind of led to the birth of a company. And here we are. That's awesome. Thank you. Interesting. Great stories. And I'm sitting here and I feel very much like a fangirl because I'm next to Gail Theron, who was my trusted voice growing up. And then Deb, who was a supersonic pilot. So when I was a little girl, I really wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to be many things, but especially a pilot, but don't have perfect vision. And back then, there was no such thing as LASIK. So kind of let that go. And then I was very good at math and science, especially science. And I loved it. And I was always that kid doing the science projects, even when they weren't required anymore. I just liked to do them and in the science club and all of those things. And there was an older student. His name was Lawrence Cole. And Lawrence was going to Florida A&M University. Joy knows Lawrence. And he was going to be drum major. And he was going to be an engineer. And I like Lawrence a lot. I thought he was really smart. And I wanted to model myself after him. And I said, I'll be an engineer. But then in 11th grade, I took AP, American Government and Economics, and it completely changed my life. It changed my world. I fell in love. I learned that there was such a thing as political science. And I had a teacher who invested a lot in me uh, in that class and then pushed me towards youth and government programs. So that's how I got to do programs like uh, Girl State, like YMCA Youth and Government. And then that summer, the summer between my junior year and senior year of high school when I participated in, in Girl State, 
and I got to be governor there. I got to meet Lawton Child. I got to sit in his chair. I got to sign bills into law, and I had an attorney general and a Supreme Court and all these things that I got to boss around. It was great. <laughs> and I learned very quickly that law is the language of government. Law is the language of policy. And so it was during that summer experience that I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. That's awesome. So, um, let's uh, start with Deb on this one. So, describe a mentor or someone who helped you along the way in your life. <laughs> so many. <laughs> um, I, I have paid many a coach. Um, I have idolized and, and followed the example of, of many a person, uh, and it would be hard to choose one. But every time I get asked this question, it always comes back to the same place. And it was my parents. Because my parents, like I said, average middle class, upper middle class family, but they were amazing. And, and I never went through that rebellious, the teenager that hates the parents phase. Uh, it, I was, my mom was my best friend, the, my whole um, school, schooling. Um, and they always, from day one, encouraged me to do what I wanted to do and, and to dare to dream. And they never once said, you can't, you shouldn't. Uh, they would voice their opinion, like they weren't crazy about their little girl going into the military, and, and they said so. But then when I said, I want to do it anyway, they were right there behind me, so they were always supportive. But what I loved most was watching them watching their love. I mean, they were in love and getting more in love every day until the day my mom died, which is rare nowadays. And they loved what they did. So mom was a housewife, never had a job outside the home, and she loved it. And I wanted to be mom, and I wanted to have a me. You know, I wanted kids. Um, my dad had his own business, and he loved it. And, and so to watch two people who went after what they wanted, made it work, became successful doing what they loved and encouraged both of their kids to do the same. That's what I always go back to. And any fork in the road that I hit, I go back to that example and it's just driven me my whole life. Oh, that's, that's special. Gail? So I kind of have two people I can talk about here um, that were really amazing. So I'm not, you know, let me just throw this out there. So when I was six years old, my father went to work one day and he never came home. He was killed on the job. He was an elevator repairman. I'm an only child. My um, mother was young. She was 29 when this happened. Um, my grandmother moved in. And so for most of my life, I was raised by two women, my mother and my grandmother. My mother remarried when I was 14. And um, Floyd came into our life. It was a little disruptive at first because I was used to my girls. Um, but he was a great stepfather. Um, so I would say from a personal standpoint, I feel like my mother and grandmother made me believe that anything I wanted to do, I could do and should do, and that they would support any decision I made, and they always did. Um, Tom McEwen, career-wise, is who really helped me. I, I, my career, as I mentioned, started as a sportscaster. And so, you know, we would go to like the box and, you, you know, we would wait, wait for the coach to come out. So we all would stick our microphones in their face and, you know, ask stupid questions like the media always does. <laughs> I'm just kidding because that's just what people think about us, but we thought we were pretty smart. <laughs> but Tom McEwen would take me by the arm and he would wiggle me right up to the front of the line. So I would be like the first person they were gonna to talk to when they walked out. And because he had this greatness in the sports world, you know, he helped me so, so, so very much. You know, he'd be like, he'd pull me up there and say, okay, you know what you're gonna ask, right? I'm like, yeah, I got my questions, okay, okay. Well, you get right up here, so you, and when the minute you see him, you put that microphone on his face. So he really was a mentor for me. He was very special in that way. Yeah, I think a lot of us do. Interesting. Similarly, I have a, a couple or could probably think of a composite and have to once again acknowledge my parents who are here who I think are the best role models in the world. When I think of mentors career-wise though, in particular, there are a couple who come to mind, one of whom is here tonight. And her name is Nancy Baginelli. 
who is my formal mentor at the firm. Now, this is just for associates, okay? I've been a partner for four years, but I told Nancy she has stuck with me for life <laughs> because she's been such an amazing mentor and really taught me a lot about what mentorship is. It's not trying to make someone just like you or make them into your mini-me. It's really helping that person to be their most authentic self, to help them grow into the fullness of themselves. So whether it was because I was having a difficult time on an assignment or just couldn't seem to get things right, or I went through a process where I wanted to wear my hair natural underneath here, believe it or not, it's a big, beautiful afro, and I was so afraid to wear my, natu my natural hair texture out at work because how would people perceive it? Um, and I'm one of a few African-American women at the firm, and would it be accepted? And Nancy has always encouraged me to be myself that as long as I was authentic and, and did the best I could that it would be okay. And it's meant so much and I know was instrumental in getting me through that process of, of being an associate at the firm because it, it can be like trial by fire, especially at a, a large law firm, and then making it over into um, to partner to shareholder. And then the other is a gentleman named Delano Stewart, who is a civil rights icon in Tampa. He is one of the first 100 black lawyers in Florida, one of the first uh, minority public defenders in town, and just a really big personality. And through my work with the Bar Association, I came to know Dell. And the thing about Dell is once he knows your phone number, he'll call you. And he's retired now, he will call you at will and at any time. And I always love it, and as much as I can, stop so that I can listen to him. Dell is 81 going on 82 next month, and that's a lot of wisdom. And he also has encouraged me to be strong, to be proud of who I am, to be bold, to walk, into, walk in my calling and my life's purpose. And, and he's another who's really been helpful. That's awesome. That's cool. Thank you. So the next question is, I want you to really dig deep in this. Okay. What was an obstacle you overcame and how did you overcome it? Now let's start with Pinterest. Yes, sir. And I, I thought about that a lot. Um, heading into tonight and am glad that you're asking this question, Renee, because I think when it can be very easy to see titles and to see success and just presume that it's all easier, that it's all been shiny. I really appreciated your remarks at the beginning, step two, where you're talking, we're not remarkable, we're just you know people who push forward and push towards our dreams. So there was a time at, at the firm early on when I was an associate and I mean, you know, coming off of a federal clerkship and having <coughs> done some really great things in school and then starting at the firm and just not quite getting it. It's like everything I tried to do turned to ash. Just nothing was right. You know, I was too slow. It wasn't fast enough. Um, just whatever you can think that could go wrong with, with an assignment would, would go wrong. And so, when you're, at, when you're in a phase in your life, and for me this was probably up and through my, my 20s, where you really aren't in the fullness of, of who you are, you can get very caught up in your accomplishments and the things that you do. You can confuse your who with your do, right? Um, as opposed to really walking in the fullness in the authentic, authenticity of who you are. And so I was all caught up in, in my, my do. And if I didn't do a thing right, then therefore I must be bad. You know, and it took a toll on my self-esteem. It was really hard. But thank goodness I had some amazing mentors at the firm and good friends, including Nancy, including Ellen, who's in the back, people who encouraged me. And I had to take a step back, really dig deep, uh, try to figure out how I could do things better, be open to constructive criticism, which is not always a comfortable space to be in, but if we're willing to go through that process and be in those uncomfortable spaces, we can learn and we can grow. And I'm glad to say that I was able to come out of it, but it was, it was a really difficult time to realize that, hey, maybe you're not as perfect as you think you are, one, and then two, to really learn that lesson of, okay, I'm not the sum of my actions or my activities. Really understand your motives for doing things and get comfortable with who you are. Because then when you can look in, when I can look in the mirror and I can realize even if I didn't do great on a task today, I'm still Fentress. I'm no less Fentress today than I was yesterday. And I'm okay with that. Thank you. Yeah. You may want to skip me on this question because I don't know really got to answer. <laughs> She's perfect. <laughs> no, Harvard. I, I was a 22-year-old goofball 
when I started my job. I mean, I was. You know, I just came out of college and I'm like all happy and I got this job and I'm a sportscaster, <laughs> which means, you know, the worst thing I was ever going to tell anybody on TV was that their favorite team lost. You know, it's not like when I got moved to the news anchor, then things got a lot more serious. But when you're a sportscaster, I mean, seriously, it was just a bundle of fun. It, it, I just had a blast. And I did that for nine years, the first nine years of my career. And I, I go back to people like Tom McEwen, who is willing to say, okay, yeah, you're a 22-year-old goofball, but you know what? You're going to be all right if you just listen to some people. And I think that's the key. I mean, when you're young, sometimes you think you, you got the world by, you know, on a string, and, um, you know, you don't. And, and, and if you're lucky enough to have a couple of people who want to help you out, and you're willing to listen, it makes a gigantic difference. You know, one of the things that's very interesting about my job is, you know, is what I kind of shared before is that people and the public will say anything to you. If you're on TV, you're their friend. They watch you every day, they know you, and they'll tell you if they hate your hair, if they think <laughs> what you wore on last Wednesday was really stupid and you should never wear that. I mean, like, everybody is related to you when you're on television. And I think one of the big obstacles I have to get over is like, your skin just has to be very thick. And, and I'm, I, I would say at the beginning of my career, I was a more sensitive person. And now you could say pretty much anything to me. You know, so I shared a story about the, the little lady who grabbed me, you know, and told me, oh, honey, you're, you're so pretty in person, be so ugly on that TV. And I, I, all you can say is thank you. And yet, <laughs> but thank you, do you really mean it? Oh yeah, I mean it. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, but that's, you know, kind of the life of being on television. You kind of belong to everybody. And everybody sees you as their own. And if you're lucky, they see you as that. If you're blessed, they see you as someone they think of as family, as someone they want in their house every day with them. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's, it was um, alarming at first. But, you know, it, I think it's just made me, um, I don't think I'm a tough person, but I think I'm a strong person. My feelings still get hurt, people say, but I, you know, really, my children probably do that hurt my feelings, but, you know, it's like, mom, you're not wearing that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there. Okay, so obstacles, they're everywhere. Like right now, it's an obstacle to talk to a bunch of shadow people because the lights are so bright. <laughs> oh, just get used to it. <laughs> so there were always obstacles, and you know things that were devastating at the time, like losing the ch state championship for the softball finals. Right. You know, on the sure. varsity team, or and everything. Um, there was a point. The stories in the book where I almost flunked out of pilot training. Uh, you know, there's always obstacles, but I never knew what an obstacle was until the big one hit. And, um, you know, I had a pretty charmed life. I was valedictorian. I went to college, got an aerospace engineering degree, uh, became an Air Force pilot, met and married the, the ma or flew supersonic jets and became an instructor, and then met and married <coughs> the man of my dreams. And we had these two beautiful, healthy children. And remember, that was my dream. I wanted to be mom. And, you know, keep in mind, I'm an aerospace engineer by training, so I plan everything, right? <laughs> and so I'm in, I'm in control. So my first child, Erin, was born on her due date. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jamie came along and she was two days late and I didn't, I thought the world was falling apart. But seriously, life was great. I mean, Mark was an incredible father and husband. He's one of those guys that used to bring me flowers just cause, you know, how cool is that? But then one day we were living in Virginia and we were uh, making Christmas cookies, literally watching the kids out playing in the snow. And he just got this, he was in this funk and I, I kept asking questions and finally he turned to me and said, Deb, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm in love with somebody else, I'm out of here. I didn't see it coming. We had three fights in 11 years. We had the most perfect marriage anyone has ever had didn't see it coming, you know, my life walked out the door, and you know, wham, everything was just over, and, and 10 days later, he and all of his stuff was gone. 
and I was devastated. I was, uh, for the first time in my life, I was totally out of control and didn't know what to do about it, and nothing I could think of would fix it. I've got these two little girls. I'm alone. I'm a single parent. I, I've got a job. I've got to get a job. I can't be the, the stay-at-home full-time, you know. And, and so everything just spiraled, and I had a dead-end job that I hated. My health went with it, and I ended up carrying around a, a pill pack of prescription medications that I had to take all day just to function. But the side effects were worse than what I was taking them for. And my answer to all that was antidepressants, higher and higher doses. And, and at 37 years old, now you think about the way life started. At 37 years old, I was convinced that the best of life was behind me. And it was just those two little girls that kept me going. Uh, but then I kind of had a wake-up call. I discovered some concepts, some other things I now teach that I hadn't been taught in school. And it just kind of made a light bulb go off that, you know, I created the success. Guess what I was creating now? The misery, the failure. It was all me. It wasn't the circumstances. It wasn't his fault, her fault. It wasn't Mark's fault because he left me. I'm creating it one way or another. And that aha moment kind of turned everything around and, and I kind of, the old me came out and said, you know, you did it before. Do you want to continue to create this or do you want to go back to that? And, and so I quit that dead end job eventually. I moved to Florida just cause. I started my own business. We ended up founding a nonprofit that has made a lot of difference here in Florida, um, breaking the cycle of domestic violence and abuse. And everything's just gone from one level to the next to the next. But the best part is I learned through that downfall. And a lot of components were in that. So the old me never could have related. And nobody out there could have related to you know, the jet jockey. But my life's been just as tragic in many ways as anybody else's. And now we can relate. And so like I said before, the greatest joy I have now isn't what I do. It's what the people I work with do, and, and seeing that twinkle in their eye and, and that smile and watching them go inside, as Renee said, and find something they didn't know was there. That's what it's all about. And, and that's why I said yes to this, because anytime I can get in front of people and, and say, you know, you got this, don't give up and don't give in and don't become the expert misery creator like I was. Take it the other direction. <laughs> so, um, we just take the temperature of the audience out here. You guys thinking of some questions that you want to ask? If we have that opportunity, just a little bit. So, give me. Okay, I got one more question, and then I'm going to go out to the audience, and we're going to we're going to let you guys um, ask some questions that anyone out here. So, what advice? And then we'll just go with you and come on down this way. What advice would you give someone who wants to um, make a career change? Um, has a dream they want to pursue, um, you know, just crazy thing that, you know, they're thinking of, it's not at them, you know, what advice would you give them to, to have them get off the dime? Okay, so think about it this way. You only get one life. There is no more, right? So you can trudge along settling for what you're stuck with, justifying why you should be happy with what you're stuck with, which is what I did for years. I should be happy because. And just kind of trudge your way to the end and, and you get to the end and you know, you're looking down at the coffin or looking up at St. Peter and going, I wish I had. Or you can take a risk. You can dare to dream. You can kind of put it out there. And I'm not talking about being foolish. I'm talking about taking a risk. Daring to dream and facing your fear of change. Your, your fear of the unknown. Because that's the only thing holding all of us back is we're comfortable where we are even if we don't like it. We're just afraid of what might be on the other side, afraid of change, afraid of discomfort. But why not risk it and just run through life enjoying every minute so that when you get to the end, you're skidding into that grave going, woohoo, what a ride. You know? I mean, says the pilot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You're going to fall. We all are going to fall on our face over and over and over again. So why not do it trying to make life better instead of settling for what we're stuck with? Take a risk. Believe in yourself. Dare to dream. 
take that first baby step and trust God or the universe, depending on your belief system, to show you the path and give you what's in your heart instead of analyzing your way to more of the same for the rest of your life. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I already disclosed earlier that um, Deb, Deb has been my coach. Um, what's the tagline that you use for um, start to... Okay, everybody's heard ready, aim, fire. Correct? That's what we're taught. Get ready. Come up with a plan, especially in the business world. You need that business plan. You, you know, what about this? What about that? Oh, better plan some more. Okay, ready, aim, fire. Oh, no, wait a minute. What about this? What about that? Forget all that because logic, that bully in your brain, that fear of discomfort will keep you stuck in a loop, getting ready to get ready to get ready to get ready to get ready, and we just become expert procrastinators. Well, if instead we take ready, aim, and we switch them, now it's and we switch the fire part, and it's aim, fire, ready. Take aim, set the standard, dare to dream. Identify what you want, because here's the thing. If you don't put it out there, then you have no need to know how to get what you want. So again, God or the universe, depending on your belief system, it's kind of like the CIA. If you get information when you need to know it. So if you aim and put it out there, this is what I want, and then you fire and take that first step, then the ready part will come because one step at a time, you'll figure out the next step, the next step, the next step. But if you never decide to do it in the first place, you have no need to know how to get there. So aim, fire, ready. Go for it. Yeah. Well, I, I can't really say much more than you've already said there. I, seriously, I mean, that, was, that was empowering. It's what you so did. awesome. You know, I, it's what I, I'll go back to what I said earlier, is to thine own self be true. We all know what's true for us. And sometimes where we get in trouble is we try to be somebody else or do something that we're really not that interested in or we know we're not good at, but we're just going to try it anyway. Well, I'm, I'm never going to say don't try things that you're afraid of being, you're not going to be the best at. But seriously, you, what we all need to find is what, what makes us happy. At the end of the day, what makes you happy? What gives you your joy? And if you can figure that out, I think you have got literally the world in the palm of your hand. Because I think that's like the age old question that people struggle with. You know, what makes me happy? You know what makes me happy? Playing with my dogs, seeing my kids, watching my flowers grow. It's really basic and it's really simple, but those are the things. Oh, and if I and I play golf and if I if I have a really good round of golf, that makes me so happy. I can't even tell you, but I don't uh, derive much of my joy from that. Just so you know, um, it, but it comes from the things that are just important to me, um, and the things that are important to me get almost all of my attention. I try to let all the little stuff go. I used to get all wrapped around the axle about things. I just let all that stuff go. And, and the money will always come. She, she said it before. She gets paid, got paid to talk. To talk. You know, I get paid to tell people what they don't want to hear so they're not afraid of it. <laughs> I have to tell you, um, I'm so um, great, grateful that Gail decided to come. I've never met Gail Sears, but I relentlessly, she thought I probably thought I was stalking her. <laughs> it's like, she's a first, you know, Deb's a first, Pinterest's a first. Oh, wow. So I just like, really, it's great that you, you know, she's retired and enjoying her life. I am having and the best she, old time. And I just tracked her down. I have this thing I'm doing. And she's like, I'll do it. So Why thank you. I? I've learned so much just sitting between these two. I feel like That's a dummy in the room right now. I'm just like Harvard, the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I think a few things, and one of them is that you can't get caught up in what you're supposed to be. And I think that plays into the fear factor, and that supposed to be can work many ways. I wasn't supposed to go to Harvard, probably, from a public school in Polk County. I know I wasn't supposed to be the first black woman to be president of the student government. were attempting to oppose me to do that because I didn't fit the molds or I wasn't the heir apparent, if you would. I, I didn't look like what the heir apparent should. If you get caught up in what you're supposed to be um, and what people try to define you as and tell you what you can't be, you'll remain stuck. You do have to dare to dream. And sometimes that means pursuing your goal even if you're afraid. 
even if you're afraid, you can come up with a plan. I guess that's the, the, the ready part. You can come up with a plan and know what you're supposed to do and work that plan. Even if you're terrified to death doing it, you can absolutely work that plan and take steps and take action to move you toward that goal. And the other thing is that you have to be very clear about your intention. And I think you ladies were alluding to that. You have to know what it is that you want to do. And it takes time to figure that out. I mean, really, who are you and what do you want to be? What do you want to do? But once you figure that out, it's amazing just the clarity that you can walk in and the opportunities that come to you. Once I got more clear that I want to do more public speaking, it's amazing the people that I've met, including Renee. And I'm here tonight and it's just, it's remarkable to me. But I, I would say those two things. Don't get caught up in the supposed to be and what other people are going to think about it. Because you know what? Everybody's going to have an opinion no matter what anyway. So you might as well be doing the thing that you want to do. What are like, right? <laughs> and uh, and get, get clear. Get clear on your intention what you want to do. Great. Okay. Thank you. So who has a question? Someone over here then? Can you stand up? I think maybe everyone can hear y'all repeat it if we can't hear you. Hey, Renee. Um, What's your name? Oh, this James. James. Bro, this panel just need to be commended. And I want you to follow me on this and kind of parallel what I'm finna say. Um, I finished school in the sixth. Okay, uh, all black uh, school in a little, little town called Bartow. And right in front of our school, we had a golf course. And it's amazing. I can remember one day our coach was <coughs> on the golf course playing. He's black. It was all white uh, <coughs> uh, course. And the teacher, and the kids just ran to the window, just amazed to see a black man on, on uh, playing cards. Now you young ladies, just think about it. You in a, what I call a man's world. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Oh yeah. Fly the jet. <laughs> yeah, ESPN. Fentress, <laughs> <laughs> Paul. <laughs> First flight of uh, student go, just think about that. So I know you had to have Oscars in your life, affairs in your life, things just thrown at you all kind of way. So I just want to tip my hand to, you know what, Renee, you need to take this show on the road. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who else? The question? Right here? Um, Can we roll it? <laughs> so I wanted to know uh, did you have a situation where being a woman, I know Gail, you know, especially in sports, but was your obstacle? Um, and can you talk about? Can you hear that back there? No. Being a woman, did Gail face obstacles as a result of being well, a woman? And, and, every, and just everyone, being, anybody wants like to weigh in. Being in a man's world, where you got a situation yeah. where your sex was the issue that maybe was not getting you to where you wanted to be. Being a woman getting in the way of the big team. Well, I had good male mentors. Going back to Tommy Q, I mean, I really did. I had good male mentors, and that meant everything back then because there weren't very many women doing sports. You know, uh, there's a part of me that really wishes I'd saved some of the fan mail, or not so fan mail, that I used to get when I was a first a sportscaster. You know, it, it's like, a woman doing sports? Are you crazy? <laughs> like, you know, there weren't many of us. But I honestly, I don't ever look back and feel like I was discriminated against. I don't ever look back and feel like it was a tough road. I feel like I was blessed. I really do. And maybe I was just, you know, I was clueless. And I just didn't know that it was as hard as it was, but it, it just wasn't that hard, you know? Um, I remember one of the toughest things I ever had to do, and it's so interesting now uh, because of the friendship I have, but. Uh, John McKay, who was the first coach of the Bucks, John said was a tough guy. You know, he didn't even like the male sportscasters. He thought they were a pain in his butt. So you could only imagine what he thought I was. And you know, I was there was 
me and me and me when it came to women who were in, you know, and sticking the microphones in their face. And you know, he, he, he was tough and he would look at you and he'd roll his eyes if you didn't ask, you know. As it turns out, his son Richie and his wife Taryn are two of our, my very best friends. And as John, so as he got to be an older man and no longer a coach, I got to know him as a, per, as a person, not the coach, and he was the most sweet, delightful, kind man you could imagine. But I lived in terror of asking a question that he thought was stupid because he would eat me alive or anyone else, but especially me back in the day. Um, you know, it's those are the people who make you stronger, though. Those are the people who make you stronger. Anybody else want to weigh in on that question? Okay. Yeah, I, I have a, a different angle on that than most people do. Uh, it, it pretty much parallels what Gail was saying, though. What, what I have found is that what you give energy to, you find. What you look for, you find. And so, yes, it was there. And I could, I could show, tell you funny stories of little subtleties of, you know, in, in the military when I was going through, it was that time of change when women were going, starting to go into combat and starting to go this and starting to go to the academies. And so I was the transition classes. And so it was there, but they couldn't do it openly or they'd lose their jobs. So they would do it subtly behind the scenes. Uh, at, when I was running the Green Building Program for half the state of Virginia, the funny story I, I love to tell is I'm the inspector. I certify the houses. I'm running the program. And I'd go up to this house and something wouldn't be right. And I mean, the energy laws, it's dictated by the government. It is what it is. And the, they've got the checklist and the standards. And I'd get this little girl. <laughs> I've been doing this since before you were born. And let me tell you, and he'd go on to tell me how it was supposed to be done. I said, well, you know, I respect that, sir, but you still failed. And I had the, I had the, <laughs> the piece of paper. <laughs> so there was funny stuff like that. But my point is, what other people think of you is none of your business. That's the truth. Because do you want to know the cold hard truth? They're not really thinking about you anyway. They're too busy thinking about themselves, wondering what you're thinking about them. So if you look for discrimination, if you look for negativity, you will filter it out. And so as I went through all these man's world jobs, I did well and continue to progress because I let it roll off my back. Yeah, you got it. And didn't look for it. I had friends who were devastated and driven out and because that's all they saw, that's all they talked about, so they, they attracted more of it. So again, I go back to dare to dream, go after what you want, and if that's out there, so what? It's out there for every person, from someone, for some reason, so ignore it. Yeah, you can allow yourself to be a victim in exactly. whatever job, whatever environment you're in. You can allow that to happen, but I wouldn't advise it. I did want to say just a, a few things, and there definitely have been situations, I wish I could say no, but there have been situations where I think the subtleties, and sometimes not so subtle, but implicit bias is at play. Implicit bias, um, is it people familiar with this topic, this concept, some are. Implicit biases are, are different from stereotypes. Um, everyone has implicit bias. It's this subconscious thought pattern that you may have about people or about a group of people, and they register within an instant. I mean, you don't think about it. It's really in your subconscious. Everybody has them. There are free tests online. You can go and take it. I'm proud to say Harvard pioneered that research, so <laughs> you can go online and, and find that test. And what you'll find is, if you're like me, you think, well, I'm a very reasonable person and I love everybody. Clearly, I have no biases, but, but you do, and everyone does. But the power in this research is that everyone can learn to de-bias. There are, are things that you can do to de-bias in a situation or interrupt bias when it happens. Now, when I was much younger, there were times where situations like that might, might crush me. If I walk into a courtroom and I'm presumed to be the court reporter, and I'm like, does the court reporter show up in this? <laughs> like this? You know, there are times where if you let it, it could crush you, or it might happen um, in, in meetings sometimes where I, I've, I've been in situations where I felt like some of the, the men in the room support each other more than they support the women in the room, or they might try to talk over me, 
or I was in the hallway a couple weeks ago um, talking with one of my male partners and another male partner came and interrupted. And I said, oh no, <laughs> you can continue this when he and I are through. And then he kind of continued and I said, okay, and I walked away. And then I could see the look on their faces and they felt so, so horrible about it. And within 10 minutes, they were both in my office apologizing. There was a time where I would have stood there silently, but now I know, and I hope that you're empowered to know that too, that you can interrupt bias when it happens, you know? Stay focused on the goal and what you're trying to get out of the interaction and let that guy do. Your family has to be so proud of you. I'm just looking at all of them. If, if, if my daughter was sitting here talking like this, I'd be like, oh my God. I'm related to her. That's so awesome. They came from Lakeland, right? They came from Lakeland tonight. That's so awesome. Oh, thank you so much for that. So um, I like to stay on time. And um, as advertised, um, we are going to wrap up this portion and um, the uh, amazing Wonder Women, and you're all Wonder Women, and there's a few Wonder Men, uh, will be available for photo ops if you'd like. There's food to eat still, and a lot of uh, beverages. But um, I want to um, ask that you give a round of applause for these women making time for this. I'm going to stand for you guys. One last thing. When you um, came in, in your chair, there's a little a little handout. In there, there's some tools and opportunities there for you. The last page, if you would for me, please, tear off the last page and take some time to give me feedback on the night and leave it at the desk before you leave. If you would, I would greatly appreciate it. And so now, let's mix and mingle. Hey, We're Renee. Here until 8 Renee, can I interrupt? Because that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> You're allowed. Guys, Renee's being modest up here. Um, oh. And she'll probably, you know, smack me when we're done. But take a look at the middle page. You know, one of the things that I really get into and, and teach is what um, Ventress was talking about, the subconscious mind. We do things that we don't even know we're doing. Well, one of those things is that we do out of, everything out of habit. And that's why we can read a book, but our life doesn't change. We can read 20 books and our lives don't change. We can come to 80 of these presentations and our lives don't change. You guys just got a lot of really valuable information. Yes? Yes. No? Okay. Chances are you'll never use it because that's how we're wired. We go back home and life gets in the way and we're right back to our old habits. So wouldn't it be cool if you could learn to use and actually put to use in your own life what you got here today. And that's what Renee's offering on the middle page. There's a chance to do that. And on that last page is an event that I'm having here, a uh, Wonder Woman workshop. If you're interested in coming, please sign up by 10 o'clock tomorrow night for a discount. If you're not interested in coming, think of somebody who might be able to benefit. Okay, spread, spread the word. I cannot close this out without recognizing someone that's in the house. The first female police chief from my hometown, Tampa, and a fellow Chamberlain chief came in just a few minutes ago, and I just got to give a shout out for Jane Castro, who joined us. Mentor, mentor, and enjoy yourself. We're here until 8 o'clock, and uh, thank you so much for coming.